Welcome, welcome. This is the Enlightenment Show, and I'm your host, Laurie Schoenfeld. This is where Chicken Soup for the Soul meets the artist way with Nancy Drew. Our guest today is my good friend, Lindsay Flanagan, author of Anna Gray and the Constellation. We're going to be chatting with her today all about her new release and how fantasy has played an important part in her life. Hello, Lindsay. Hi, Lori. How are you? I'm so good. I am happy to have you joining us today. Thank you for having me. It's always a pleasure talking with you. I feel exactly the same with you. How long has it been, Lindsay? You mentioned 10 years ago on a post. I'm like, has it been that? It's just swooped by. Yeah, I may have estimated, but I think it's a good nine, eight, nine, ten years that you and I met and we were both writing manuscripts that I don't even know if if we're writing anymore, working on anymore. <laughs> um, yeah, we were in like a, a writing group at a conference and we just, you're just the nicest and kindest person and you're just so easy to talk to. And I was just, I just remember reading your work though, going, this girl can write. Like, I've got critiques, always, but this girl can write. <laughs> Thank you, Lindsay. And that's exactly how I feel with your writing. I read your book twice because it was so magical and so good. And there were beautiful lines woven all throughout your story. Thank you. So I'm super excited to introduce it to the world, which actually releases tomorrow. Tomorrow, it's the big book birthday. <laughs> Yay! An August birthday tomorrow. How are you feeling? <laughs> um, wow. So yeah, it's been it's been 10 years and it, <laughs> it almost doesn't feel real yet. You know, everybody's everybody in my family and friends are like, oh my gosh, this is so exciting. And it is exciting, but it's also like, well, I've kind of been planning for this for a long time. And now that it's finally here, I don't think I'm nervous. I think I'm just ready, ready to share my story. Mm -hmm. Did you, when you were writing this book, Lindsay, did you have pieces of visualizing where you wanted to go as you're pushing yourself through you know, those long drafts? <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, you know, it's funny because the very first draft of this book was only 40,000 words. Um, now it's 63,000. Um, and I had two very amazing um, critique partners tell me like exactly what I needed to fix with the book. Um, and I had realized I only had a shell of a story and I didn't have a real true heroine that was going on a journey. I just had all these fantastical ideas with magic and magical land and magical creatures. And I loved it so much. But what the key ingredient I was missing was this person that we could go on a journey with. And I think I've created her now. <laughs> hmm. Let's dive into that. Can you share with our listeners and viewers what Anna Gray and the Constellation is all about? Yes. Oh, this is like the hardest part. This is the hardest question that you, you can ask an author, right? Because they're like, well, let me tell you. And then it's like 10 hours later. <laughs> um, <laughs> but okay, so I have practiced this and the story follows Anna Gray's journey to a magical realm where finding answers about her night vision ability means allying with her worst enemy to save the true heir to the throne. Mm. So, I was so proud of myself when I finally got that down. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. How, you know, we write these novels and that's hard work, but trying to find a pitch and a blurb to explain hours of work and years of work is really something else. <laughs> it is. And I have to admit this, that I did not really write my own synopsis. My critique partner, his name's Devin. He wrote it for me. <laughs> he was like, what are you doing? You're just rewriting the book. <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's so hard. It, and then there's all these other stories that you're like, well, I have this subplot and this character and this character. And you just need to tell what the one main through line is, you know, like this is what it's about. So it is about a girl. It's about 
her dealing with what she feels are abnormalities. No, ab I'm sorry, I'm stumbling. Abnormalities, um, seeking for answers, trying to trying to find a place to fit in, and um, I think I did. I struggled with that as a kid. I my daughters struggle with that now, and I wanted to explore that and show my daughters you're not alone. You know, everybody's dealing with this. And, um, I think, I think with Anna Gray, she's a pretty good mix of, of me and my daughters and, and girls I've known and talked to, and she's just a good mix. And she's, she's got her flaws and she learns, you know, and, and she finds her herself. So this will be a three book series. So in the first book, you know, you might go, oh, what's next? And it's coming. <laughs> <laughs> I love how Anna Gray is 14 because that is right in the middle of all of the things that are uncomfortable and trying to process ourselves and explore and mm -hmm. lots of social and physical layers, mental layers that come into that, which you did a great job with. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, I really um, delved into her to see where she was coming from and where she was going to go. And you're a writer, so you know that sometimes your characters just kind of take on a life of their own and you're like, oh, OK, OK, we'll go there. Um, and it surprised me. She's definitely a lot braver than I ever was. Um, but she's who I hope my daughters will be, too. Mm -hmm. So 10 years ago. Is that when it started was 10 years ago? Can you share our, your journey with us a little bit? <laughs> well, that would probably have to go back to when I was probably five or six. And I just fell in love with reading. And I wanted to be the one that brought my book to class and read it out loud because I loved it. <laughs> um, and in probably about second grade, I started writing my own stories. Um, it was about a horse named Black Beauty. It was so original. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I illustrated it myself and I cannot draw. But I remember that moment because it's where I was like, I love all these characters that I'm reading about, but what if I could create my own character? And yes, she was a black horse named Black Beauty, but she was my own Black Beauty. Um, so I continued to write. I, I don't remember a time when I wasn't writing. Um, when I really first started like trying to write a full length novel was probably about 2005 or six. And it was a, a world war two novel. <laughs> a little and, different. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It didn't go anywhere. And then I, I started writing a fantasy trilogy, which I did finish. Um, but, I, and that was about 2011 when I finished it. And, I can go back now and I'm like, wow, you have so many issues. <laughs> but it was a really good learning experience. I started querying that one. I didn't get any bites. I am not surprised because I hadn't honed my craft yet. Um, and it wasn't the right story to tell. But um, some people who knew that I wrote that fantasy trilogy, they're like, what did you do with that? Well, I didn't trash it. Um, it actually served as some of the backstory for um, Anna Gray's parents. So it informed some of this story. So, um, and then Anna Gray, I started writing in 2015, first started querying in probably 18 or 19, um, didn't get any bites. And then I have this moment and I should, I know I have my book somewhere, but I have this moment where I stumbled across um, Save the Cat Writes a Novel by Jessica Brody. And it changed my whole writing life. <laughs> it, it is such a good book. And it's so like, it's so step-by-step step and, and it feels like some people are like, oh, that's formulaic, but no, yes and no, but I'm still very free to write my own story within this structure. Mm -hmm. um, and as a developmental editor, that's what I do for my day job. Um, that's what I do. You know, I help people structure their, these wonderful stories so that it works so that readers won't put them down. And I really applied that to my Anna Gray manuscript. And then what do you know? I started getting bites and I started getting full requests. And um, in 2020, I signed with my agent. And in 2021, we signed a publishing contract. So it's been a journey. It's It's been a really long, but educational and it's been a good journey. 
Anna Gray, your main character, can see in the dark, which I absolutely love. Is that something that you learned early on when you were writing your book, or is that a piece that just developed as you were continuing through edits? Uh, yeah, it developed as I was writing her, um, because when I originally wrote the story, it was actually Iris's story, who you'll find when you read it. Um, if you look on the cover, she's this gorgeous horse-like creature that I created all on my own. I'm sure there are antlered horses in, in mythology everywhere. But for me, I wanted her to be a unicorn, but unicorns are, you know, everybody loves unicorns and I wanted her to be very different. But um, it was her story that I was writing. And so Anna Gray didn't really have a, a whole a whole lot to tell until I really dove, like, took a deep dive into her character. And um, one of my writing partners, she was like, this is not the unicorn story. This is Anna Gray's story. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> um, so in finding ways to connect Anna Gray to the magical world, I wanted her to have some sort of ability that was really, really cool, but also could be looked at as kind of, you know, her. she was very different from her classmates. Um, so nobody knows she can see in the dark, but they can see that her eyes do not look like a regular human being's eyes. So I wanted her to be able to struggle with something that was different. And that thing that made her different was what made her unique and powerful. Mm -hmm. So your unicorn, you the name for it is an Aobanic. Aobanic, yeah. <laughs> okay, I love the name. Tell us about what you enjoyed most about creating your unicorn and explain the name too. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, of course I, I wanted her to be a unicorn because I wrote Black Beauty and I'm in love with horses and <laughs> and my daughters were really big into unicorns and I've, I've always been into unicorns. It's just a beautiful, magical creature. Um, but I wanted her to be my own style of unicorn and um, deer antlers and elk antlers and elk and deer themselves, I think are beautiful. And I thought if you could just mash that creature together, what would it look like? And um, she has, she's very brightly colored. Like her mane is a rainbow mane and she's got glowing, like a glowing coat um, and gold hooves. So she's still very magical, very like unicorn, very rainbow bright vibes for people who grew up in the <laughs> <laughs> Um <clears throat> but um, I did want her to be something different. I wanted her to be something of my own. And in that fantasy trilogy that I wrote that, you know, will never see the light of day that only informs these stories, um, I had created another magical race. Um, they're shape sh shapeshifters, basically. Um, but I wanted my unicorn, my Aobanic, to be something different than them as well. So mm -hmm. as I was looking through, I'm really fascinated by language. Um, I took French in college and I just love to learn where words come from and what they know. Um, I could probably read the dictionary for fun. But, <laughs> um, I wanted to take the name for unicorn and like mash it with some of these other languages that I love. So French, and I think I looked at German and Irish, and I believe it's the Irish one where I really got that A-O, A-E-O. Mm. And then I loved the way that sounded. And then I just kind of mashed a whole bunch of letters together and went, yeah, okay, that's it. That's it. That's, that's the word. So. I love that because I was debating if it was Irish when I was saying it a few times to make sure I didn't slaughter it. It felt very <laughs> Irish. So yes. <laughs> yes. you hit on that. I also really got the vibes of uh, My Little Pony, too, which brought so much nostalgia yes. <laughs> into the book. So thank you. That was a lot of fun, too. Yes, thank you. I was definitely a My Little Pony fan, and my <laughs> daughter still is, and my husband's a brony. So, yeah. <laughs> Did you have a favorite part about writing the story? Um, I think I liked discovering where Anna Gray was taking me. Like I had an idea of where she needed to go and where she needed to end up, but I liked kind of figuring out, seeing what decisions she would make. And especially because sometimes my gut feeling was, no, I, I would do this. But then I was like, wait, Anna Gray would do this. 
Um, I liked having her make mistakes too, because I think that sometimes there's so much expectation to be perfect um, and she's not, and she knows it. And, you know, she messes up and she gets mad at her best friend and, um, but she's really trying to do what's right, but she's also trying to figure out who she is. And I think discovering her was one of my favorite parts. Um, I'm a poet at heart. I wrote a lot of poetry through high school and college. And so going back through and doing some of those prose edits, that was fun. Like I could just sit there and just write prose all day. So <laughs> that, was, that was fun. There were, I'm sure I'll have to send you the lines that I came back to, but there were quite a few that were written so beautifully that I read multiple times. So thank that, you. That <laughs> came through thank for you. sure. Thank Your you. two daughters had a part in supporting you in the process. Tell us about that. Yes, <laughs> they definitely did. My oldest daughter um, is one of my readers. She reads my manuscripts. She tells me, a teenager wouldn't act like that or a teenager wouldn't do that, or they wouldn't say that um and she's also like she's very much into like the love triangle and so she's like so who are they gonna be with <laughs> well, that's not the point of this story but it's really fun to hear her tell me what she likes about it what she kind of wishes anna gray would do um and then she'll read it and she, she's pointed things out to me where she's like wait this didn't happen in this book. You need to go back and fix it. So she's been very, very helpful and supportive in that. And then my little one, she just loves unicorns so much that she's always like, okay, what's Iris going to do? Is she going to like win the day, save the day? And yeah. So they're very fun. They dressed up with me. Um, the Halloween after I signed my publishing contract, we, we dressed up as characters from the book. So I think we'll do that again this year. It should be fun. That would be, I'm curious to see who you dress up as. So we'll have to get a picture <laughs> later when that comes together. <laughs> what would you say is something that you've struggled with the most on the writing journey? Oh, wow. Um, I think that finding plot holes was hard. It was like, no, I want this to work but it's not working how I want it to. And then I have to disassemble everything and start again. And for me, that was frustrating, but it was also like a learning lesson because I am a perfectionist. I'm like, and then there was also that part of me that was like, but I've written such beautiful prose here and I don't want to get rid of it. <laughs> um, so that was, that was hard. It was like, well, can't we just turn a blind eye to this plot hole and keep on <laughs> please? Um, that was hard. That was, that was very hard. No. Um, and I can't even tell you how many times I have stripped down this book and just started over. But yeah, it's it's been a, a journey. My my second book was not. I had learned so much writing the first book that it I feel like I haven't had as many rewrites with the second book, but um, it's in developmental editing with my publisher right now. So we'll see what happens. <laughs> and then uh, I'm writing the third book right now and. I, I had found myself kind of falling into some of those same issues of, well, I just want this to happen. Why can't this just happen? And I'm like, wait, lesson learned, you know, back up and figure this out. So mm -hmm. I love to write. So the figuring out part is a little bit difficult for me. If that makes any sense at all. It completely does. And I'm snickering a little bit because Lindsay was my editor for Little Owl. And I remember a specific point when she was editing my pages and she said, I think that you're starting in the wrong place. And I had that same thing with the plot holes. I'm like, no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> We're fine moving along, but it, it definitely needed to start somewhere else. But yeah, sitting in the, no, I'm sure a blind eye, no one will notice. Yeah. <laughs> Seriously, that's still one of my night terrors. Like, oh my gosh, somebody's going to find something wrong with it. <laughs> which is fine, which is totally fine. <laughs> you learned something and you taught me a lot in that moment of having me explore and examine a different perspective, which made it stronger. So thank you as well. well I love that. You're welcome. That's, I love helping authors shape their stories. So 
I dig my heels in with my own stories, but helping <laughs> it's it's more fun. <laughs> What's something that you hope young readers will take away from your book? Oh, wow, that is a good question. Um, I hope that they will look at Anna Gray and actually all the the characters that I have written. I I hope they learn something that they can apply to their own lives. Like if they have something about them that they think is too odd or too different, different if they, they learn how to embrace that and use it for, for good. That's what makes them special. Um, don't want to give away any spoilers, but um, I hope that my bad guy is redeemable. Well, one of the bad guys, he's not the main antagonist, but um, I hope he's redeemable because I think we all make mistakes and we all hurt other people, whether intentionally or not. Um, and it does take Anna Grace some time to forgive and that's okay too, you know? Um, but in the end, she's a better person because she's able to just let it go. Mm -hmm. And I, I hope that, you know, people can learn to be forgiving and forgivable as well. Mm, yes. How has fantasy played an important part in your life? Um, wow. I think I've always just kind of lived half in a fantasy world because I'm <laughs> half my brain was always creating stories and it was, it was a way to kind of navigate the world we're living in, you know, um, lessons that you can can learn through fantasy is just it's very applicable to real life even though we don't have night vision and we don't we're not able to shape shift i mean who knows maybe we are just don't know <laughs> um it's fun to explore that and see how you could deal with your own life the way these characters are dealing with magic issues and fantasy world issues um I, I'm a huge Lord of the Rings fan, and I think I continually learn from that book um, and even the movies. I love the movies. Um, I think you can learn a lot about life from fantasy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You are a fantastic photographer as oh, well. You. What do you enjoy about photography? Um, I always tell people this, that my... One of my critique partners once told me that my photographs were like my writing, um, otherworldly and fantastical. Mm -hmm. um, and so I do take a lot of photos, but I do like to get in and edit them and make them look otherworldly. I like to have them look like they could come from a fantasy world. Um, even like, even just like portraits of people, you know, how do you want to look? How do you want to feel different? I did a family photo shoot once and they were all wearing cowboy hats and I really wanted to make the photographs feel like the old West. So um, with writing, I love writing fantasy. Um, I don't love editing myself, but I love writing fantasy with photography. I like taking photos, but I love editing them to make them feel fantastic. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like my two, my two loves kind of, I come at them from different angles. Do you go out on walks and just capture things as you go? Or do you go at specific times of day and have a set idea of where you want to go? Walk us through that. Um, I would love to have like an hour each day where I can just go somewhere and take photographs. <laughs> but I have kids and I have dogs and the dogs make it really hard to like snap a photo because <laughs> three of them. Um so I just take every opportunity I can. Like I try to keep my eye open for things that might not be noticed by someone else. Um, just the other day I was walking through this area in my hometown called the Northfields and it's still very like, it's still um, livestock, you know, gravel road. It's like one of the last bits of my hometown that still feels very old hometown. Like I remember it. Um, but I was just kind of looking, just keep, just looking, not really looking for a photo op, but I saw these, um, I believe they're called choke cherries. I could be wrong, but they're these little tiny red plants and with purple plants, like little flowering bushes. And they had grown up onto the barbed wire. And I just thought, I need to take a photo of that. Hmm. So with one hand with the with the dog and one 
with the iPhone. I just walked over and I snapped a photo and I didn't know if it would work out. But in the editing process, I was able to make it look like I would want to look at it in a fantasy world. That was a long explanation, but yes, I, <laughs> <laughs> every opportunity I can get. <laughs> that you gave the visualization of like, that was like a circus act. And I'm like applauding you of holding, you know, the dogs and trying to balance, you know, your camera. Phone. <laughs> <laughs> it happens a lot. Yes. It's a lot of the balancing act. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to take it to the inner child question segment. Are you ready, Lindsay? I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. First question. If you're going through a portal, where would you go and why? Um, okay. So I am going to answer this by telling you that when I was a kid, I grew up in the same town I live in now. Um, I moved away and then I, I came back, but I lived right by this North Fields. Um, area. And it was a lot bigger when I was younger, there were more fields. Um, and I do live in that same area again, not in the same house. Um, but when I was a kid, we kept our horses in the field next to our house. And it was, this was in the eighties, right? My mom would just be like, go out and play. And yeah, can we go to the field? Yes, you can go to the field. So we'd go out to the North fields and there were these huge willow trees and there was, um, little streams. And it was, to me, it was magical. Mm -hmm. um, I could play in the trees all day and then go home. Um, and my horses were there. And of course they were unicorns in my mind. My, my unicorns were, you know, <laughs> out there. Um, but I would ride my horses bareback in the field. I would, you know, I'd climb the trees and sit up in the tree houses. And I would, when I played, I would play out a story. Like I would write a story in my head as I was playing. And as I was sitting down trying to think about Anna Gray and where she would stumble into, that was it. It was this place in Heber and it's still there. And I hope it's never torn down. Like the field is, the trees are still there, but the field is now has um, homes and condos in it, but the mm -hmm. trees themselves are still there. And I just think that, you know, if I could just walk through those trees, I know I could find those two trees that would lead me to a magical portal where the entire world is just that place. Um, yeah. So that's where I would go. <laughs> that sounds magical and beautiful to me. I love willow trees too. They're beautiful. Yeah. They definitely speak magic for sure. <laughs> I think so. I think so. And it might be from, um, like when they grow over like canals and streams and stuff, the way their leaves just hang down into it. It's just, it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. beautiful. Yeah. You know, if you pull that curtain of trees back, you know, you're going somewhere magical. A hundred percent. Growing up, what were some of your favorite fairy tales or folk tales? Ooh, wow. That's a good question. Um, well, quite honestly, when I was younger, I didn't read a ton of folk and fairy tales. I was more into the Babysitter's Club <laughs> and um, <laughs> Sweet Valley High and oh or Sweet gosh. Valley Twins. Yeah, like yeah, Sweet yeah. Valley Twins. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I was definitely into that. Um, and I don't know if it's it was until... I was a little bit older that I started reading um, some fantasy and it was Lord of the Rings that was, that got me into it. Um, definitely Harry Potter was a gateway fantasy book. Mm -hmm. um, I love, love young adult fantasy. Um, what am I reading right now? It's the light between the worlds. I'll have to tell you who the author is. I can't remember, but it's beautiful. And I'll tell you right now, cause I don't want to name a book and not name the author. It is Lauren. Laura Weymouth, and it has a very Narnia feel. It takes place in 1949 Ooh. in England, and these children have come back from this. They've gone through this magical portal, and they've lived these magical, fantastical lives, but now they're back in the real world. And um, that's the kind of story I like, I like to tell because I feel like I want my book to be that fantasy where you can go in, you can be in this fantasy world, 
knowing that when you go back to your own life, your own world, that you'll, you'll have been armed with some sort of life lesson that you can apply and move forward. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I love, I love the Grimm's fairy tales. I mean, all the classic stuff like that. Um, and I like, I really have been enjoying, this might be old now, but I'm just barely getting back to reading for fun because I've been so busy. But um, I really like the reimaginings of, of classic stories. I think those are fun. One of my favorites is Heartless by Marissa Meyer. I mean, oh my gosh, that book is so good. Yeah. Yep. So good. What do you enjoy most about Lord of the Rings is there's a lot of beautiful pieces that they put with, you know, character arc, plotting, mm -hmm. uh, setting. I mean, the whole thing is just astounding how they put it together. But what is your personal favorite? Um, I quite like Eowyn. She's quite mm -hmm. an amazing uh, female character that has a lot of power. She doesn't know she wields that much power, and she does. <laughs> Um, I love the idea of little people, these little tiny hobbits who think they can't make any type of difference in the world. And suddenly they're the ones saving the world. Mm -hmm. um, I love the idea of, of being able to interact with spiritual beings, heavenly beings, so to speak. Call them what you want. The elves, you know, they're immortal and the men, they're, they're mortal and, and how they're able to interact Gosh, I love I love Tolkien's love of language, like the way he mm -hmm. he he started he created the language before he created the story, um, and that's just fascinating to me. Um, and he also spent what fifteen years writing it. I I could be getting my dates wrong, and please don't get mad at me, Tolkien. And <laughs> I can't remember, but I do know he spent a long time writing it, and it is the modern day myth you know, a fantasy and it's, it's modern fantasy at its best so, and it's yes. original as well. Third question. What is the oddest food combo that you've liked and tried? <laughs> you've just tried. <laughs> this is a random question. <laughs> oddest food combo. I don't know. I I'm from Utah. And so we eat a lot of ranch dressing and I will put ranch dressing on anything. Mm -hmm. um, ranch on pizza, uh, ranch on French fries, ranch on hamburgers, but ranch on tacos, ranch on anything, ranch on hot dogs. <laughs> <laughs> I'm loving this so much because me too. And I like, I legit carry a bottle of ranch around me in my purse, which is, you know. <laughs> In case no one has ranch, I'm covered. Yes, yes. <laughs> for sure. Yes, I do love fry sauce because it's a it's a Utah thing as well. And ranch isn't just a Utah thing, but I feel like everybody in Utah has ranch. But um, fry sauce on hamburgers and, and fries is good too. But I wouldn't put fry sauce on pizza. That's why I prefer ranch because ranch goes great on pizza. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so have you never tried fry sauce with pizza? No. Have you? I have, and it's delicious. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, I'm going to have to try it. It's a combo, yeah. <laughs> I will try it for sure. It doesn't give the same as flavor as ranch, though. It's much more sweet, which, okay. you know. So, like, if you like pineapple and ham on a pizza, which, you know, that's kind of 50-50 depending on your crowd. Yeah. Uh, it, it works for some and it totally doesn't for others. So if you don't like the sweet stuff on pizza, I would not recommend it. Okay. I won't do that. <laughs> yeah, I'm definitely the no pineapples on pizza crowd. Well, <laughs> there you go. Don't do it then. <laughs> yeah, we'll stick with ranch. <laughs> Before we end today, Lindsay, can you share with our listeners and viewers what living a creatively abundant life means to you? This is a beautiful question because I have been trying to find that balance for a long time because I want to write and I want to help authors, but of course I'm a mom and a dog mom and <laughs> I want to be present for my family. Um, so what does that, what does that look like for me? 
I think it's um, surrounding yourself with what inspires you to be creative. Um, reading good books, writing good books, talking with other authors, talking with readers and what they want to see, um, but also spending, you know, an hour each day in your own world of writing and just letting that creativity flow. Um, I once heard Rob Thomas say, and I love Rob Thomas, you know, I love Rob Thomas, <laughs> but I once heard him say that if I could just, and this isn't an exact quote, it's paraphrasing, but if I can just get some of this out on the page, then I can go on with life and be okay. Mm -hmm. And in that case, he was talking about some painful experiences, but I find that it's applicable to everything. If I can get this out onto the page, let it play out as it will, then I can move on with my day and come back and look at it with a fresh perspective. Um, and I want to, I want to tell stories and I want to tell beautiful stories and being able to do that while also lear always learning, always learning from other authors, other editors, and then just, you know, being present for family. That's a long answer. I tend to give long answers. That was so profound and beautiful. And I'm sitting in that message and that wisdom. Thank you so much for being here and joining us today. Thank Congratulations you. on your release tomorrow, Lindsay. Thank you so much. I, I, I'm excited. Like I said, I'm not nervous, but I'm definitely excited. <laughs> <laughs> Where can our listeners and viewers find you after the show if they have any questions for you about your book or anything related to writing and story? Well, um, probably the best place is my website, which is finally back up. It's just authorlindsayflanagan.com. Okay. And we will put that down in the link below. Thank you so much, my beautiful friend. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Always, always such a fun time and pleasure talking with you. I feel the same about you. And thank you so much for those who've joined us live and will join us on the replay. Remember, as you go about the rest of your week, to find the things that are working within your life. You are the creator of your own story. What steps are you gonna take next? Thank you everyone, have a beautiful rest of your week. Thank you, Lindsay. Thank you, bye.